Okay, now that we have introduced the idea of secondary structure, we're going to talk about some in particular. Um, the ones we're going to focus on are one of the helices, the alpha helix, which is super important in protein structure, and then we're going to talk about two beta sheets, the parallel and the anti-parallel beta sheet. Um, also, just think of any other non-defined secondary structure. It doesn't have an easy to visualize shape as just being random. Now remember where these secondary structures come from, right? They come from this Ramachandran diagram where we've tried to simplify all the possible conformations of a string of amino acid by freezing the peptide bond due to its double bonded character and looking at combinations of uh, bond rotations of the bonds that flank the alpha carbon, phi and psi. Right Now, let's start by thinking more in depth about the alpha helix, which has a phi uh, bond angle of minus 57, a psi bond angle of minus 47, and that leads to some sort of stability. Well, let's try to see why. Um, the alpha helix was actually predicted back in the early 1950s by Linus Pauling. Right, Linus Pauling got the Nobel Prize for this work, along with some other work he did in biochemistry and chemistry. Um, he also got a Nobel Prize for his work in um, peace, right? So he got the Nobel Peace Prize, and he's one of only a few people to get Nobel Prizes in two very different fields. Um, he also did work we talk about in Biochem 2 with vitamin C. He was a big proponent of taking huge doses of vitamin C to prevent disease uh, such as cancer. Uh, now, Linus Pauling um, figured out the alpha helix not by using computers, but by using models. So he used molecular models to try to discover, you know, conformations of amino acid chains that look like the atoms weren't bumping into each other and had some bond distances that would um, stabilize a structure. Here you can see sort of a model of an alpha helix, and um, we have these dashed lines in between the hydrogen on the nitrogen of the peptide bond, and an oxygen of a carbonyl from a different amino acid. You've probably guessed these dashed lines here indicate hydrogen bonds. And so he was able to make a model that sort of got R groups away from each other, so they weren't going to bump into each other and cause steric strain, but also had bond distances that would um, allow for productive hydrogen bonds to form um, and form this nice helical shape. Okay, So here are the phi and psi bond angles for an alpha helix. The N of a good alpha helix is 3.6. Now what is N? N it describes the number of amino acids or the number of monomers that it takes to make a complete rotation in a helix. So if you want go uh, 3.6 amino acids, you'll go from uh, location on uh, level 1 to that same location on level two. So you're going from the first floor to the second floor. It took you about three and a half, 3.6 amino acids to get there. Another example of a helix, which you've seen before, is the um, DNA double helix. The N of DNA is 10. It takes 10 base pairs to get from one location on uh, one level of the helix to the same location on uh, the next level. P is pitch. The distance between one level and the next is about 5.4 angstroms. And the alpha helix is stabilized between hydrogen bonds in the peptide chain. Again, these hydrogen bonds are not dependent on R groups. They're between the hydrogen on the nitrogen and the oxygen on the carbonyl group of peptide bonds between you know, different levels in this helix. Okay, so here's a good picture of an alpha helix and we will look at some models of alpha helices in class and give you a better sense of, of sort of how pretty these things are um, and how they accomplish you know some of these goals with regards to the stability of a molecule. Now if you look at this model over on the right side of the slide the R groups are painted yellow in this particular model and the core of the peptide chain, right, the peptide bond and other stuff, 
are you know uh, green and blue with the hydrogens as, as white and so you can see what the alpha helix does with regards to uh, stability here is all the R groups are sort of splayed out to the outside of the helix away from each other away from all the other atoms on the inside of the helix giving these R groups a, a lot of room right a lot of room so that there's less steric hindrance now just in terms of confirmation that it's a desirable trait right get those R groups away from each other to prevent steric strain and high energy but from a chemical standpoint you know it makes a lot of sense too we said when we were talking about amino acids that it was really these R groups that were providing the functionality for an amino acid or a protein and a protein function is really dependent on is dependent on the individual chemistries that are provided by the amino acids. Now, if those amino acids are present in the alpha helix secondary structure, then all those interesting R group chemistries are sort of displayed on the outside of this structure, and they can interact with other chemistries to bind things, to catalyze reactions, and so all the goodies. Um, in these amino acids are, are available and um, displayed on the outside. While the sort of more boring core peptide chain, which doesn't really differ from one amino acid to another, is buried on the inside of this, less functional. So that makes this alpha helix pretty functional. Um, alpha helices tend to span around, on average about 12 amino acids, but there's a lot of variability there. There's a net dipole sort of a positive side and a negative side to these um, helices because those hydrogen bonds are oriented in a particular way. We'll look at that in class. There's some amino acids that are good alpha helix formers and some are bad alpha helix formers. I don't really need you to know which ones are good. You might be able to guess what's a bad alpha helix former. You know, proline kills alpha helices. It's got its own bend to it, and that bend is different than that um, phi and psi bend that's formed in alpha helices. So you don't typically have prolines in alpha helices. Uh, these alpha helices can be inside or outside proteins, and we can maybe look at alpha helices and, and try to predict whether they're going to be the outside or inside. Now. What we've got here is sort of what we call um, a hydropathy plot for um, an alpha helix. Um, it, what it does is it takes that um, N of 3.6 and it plops down amino acids um, at the appropriate locations and sort of flattens that alpha helix. It's almost if we took this alpha helix here and we stomped on it with our foot and we looked at where those amino acids would be end up, end up on a flat surface. Now, what can these types of plots tell us? Well, let's look. Here's an alpha helix from a really important enzyme, citrate synthase, which is in the citric acid cycle. And if we sort of plot the amino acids with a N of 3.6, we see the, um, a particular pattern emerging. Now, these amino acids are colored um, green, blue or red. Green in this case is going to be, maybe you'd be able to see it just by looking down here, the green is the nonpolar amino acids, the blue is our polar but uncharged amino acids, and red is going to be our polar charged. So when we look at citrate synthase, overall we'd say this is a pretty nonpolar alpha helix. Now if we have a nonpolar alpha helix, where is it going to be in a protein in a cell? Well, um, we talked about water as the main solvent in biochemistry. And so this alpha helix, which is very hydrophobic, very nonpolar, would hate interacting with the solvent. And so if this was present in a globby, globular protein, this alpha helix would predict would be buried on the inside of the protein, away from the solvent on the outside. Okay, Here's one, troponin C. This is a heart muscle protein. It's actually a marker for cardiac damage and a marker for um, uh, heart, heart attacks, right? If this is 
sloughed off into your bloodstream due to heart damage. You can detect it and be able to tell there was heart damage. But it has sort of the opposite characters, our citrate synthase, alpha helix. It's got a bunch of red and blue amino acids, and we'd say overall this is a pretty polar amino acid. It would not be hidden on the inside of a protein. It would be interacting with our polar solvent, waving around on the outside. Um, and alcohol dehydrogenase, this particular alpha helix from this enzyme, um, has sort of a, a bipolar uh, character, right? It's got this side, which is very nonpolar and fatty, this side, which is very polar and charged. And so where would this one exist in a globby protein? It'd probably be on the surface, right, with this part pointing toward the interior of the protein and this polar part pointing towards the solvent on the outside. Okay. Now remember, these are just secondary structures. This is not what alcohol dehydrogenase looks like. Alcohol dehydrogenase has a lot of amino acids, not just 11, and um, it has a lot of different secondary structures. This is just one alpha helix that's present in that enzyme, and we'd predict it would be lying on the surface with the right side here interacting with the rest of the protein and this being interacting with the solvent on the outside.